Hi and welcome everybody. We'll give a, a couple of minutes for all the participants to load up on the system. It takes about 30 seconds to get everybody online. Um, this webinar today is made in COVID-19, uh, Impacts of the Pandemic on End-of-Life Choices. My name is Maureen Aslan, and I'm the Education Manager with Dying with Dignity Canada. Uh, we're very excited to have three pack practitioners with us today to talk about uh, their experiences of providing MAID uh, during the COVID pandemic. I'll just allow another minute or two for more people to get online. Um, housekeeping details. Today's webinar is scheduled for one hour and 15 minutes uh, till 4.45 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be in conversation with our panelists for the first 40 minutes or so, and then we'll be taking your live questions with the Q&A via the Zoom function. You'll see the Q&A icon in the black bar at the bottom of the screen. If you have a question for the panelists, please type in your question. Kelsey Goforth, my colleague, whose name appears on the screen, will be off camera and minding the questions and the uh, chat function so that she can provide us with, with questions in that section of the, uh, of the webinar. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to answer all of your questions. So we ask that if you have a question about eligibility for MAID, you review the information on our website, which is dyingwithdignity.ca. And if you have a personal situation that you need one-to-one -one navigation support, please reach out to us at support at dyingwithdignity.ca. The webinar today is part of our End in Mind series, which we launched in 2017. The purpose of these webinars is to engage Canadians on a broad range of issues related to death, dying, and planning for end of life. We hope that by participating in events like this one, you will come away informed, intrigued, and best of all, empowered. Today we are joined by three MAID practitioners from across Canada. Nurse practitioner Erica Maynard, Dr. Ellen Weeb, and Dr. Susan Woolhouse. We will uh, be in conversation for what it, uh, what it has been like for them to provide MAID during the COVID-19 pandemic and to share some of their experiences with their patients. Uh, what those experiences have been. We are grateful that they have made time to share their unique views and experiences with us all today. So to start off, I'm going to remove that screen and just have us live on the camera here. And I'm wondering if we can just have each of you introduce yourself so the audience can know a little bit more about you and your practice. So let's start with uh, Erica. Hi, good day, everyone. Um, are, are you able to hear me okay there? Yes. Okay, very well. So um, I graduated from nursing school out of St. John's, Newfoundland back in 1992. Um, I spent the next 15 years working in uh, intensive care settings of varied disciplines uh, from neonatal ICU to cardiovascular open heart. Um, during that time, I also completed my baccalaureate of nursing and my master's of nursing as an advanced nurse practitioner. Um, I've been a nurse practitioner since 2007, uh, working in family practice. Uh, I was on Vancouver Island until the end of 2017, and now I practice out of Annapolis Royal in Nova Scotia. Um, I'm adjunct faculty at the University of Victoria. Um, in Victoria, BC, and also here in Dalhousie in Nova Scotia. I sit on the Clinician's Advisory Council with Dying with Dignity Canada, and I'm also uh, a part of the Provincial MAID Advisory Council Group here in Nova Scotia. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Erica. We're happy to have you here. And uh, Ellen, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Oh, sure, but I'm not going to tell you when I graduated. <laughs> um, I uh, spent uh, 30 years as a family doctor and uh, started uh, providing MAID um, uh, immediately um, in February of 2016 when it was still before the C-14 law had come into place while we had to go to court with each, each patient. 
and uh, I have provided um, uh, 275 um, uh, made cases, uh, assessed over 500. I'm a clinical professor at the University of British Columbia and um, do a fair bit of research on MAID as well, including MAID in COVID. <laughs> and I got a crash course on MAID in COVID because the first month after lockdown, I had 13 deaths um, in one month, which is definitely more than my usual. I then have had, you know, less than usual the month after to make up for it, but uh, that really gave me a crash course. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you, Ellen. And um, Susan, uh, can you uh, tell us a bit about yourself and your practice? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm Susan Wolhus, and I'm really pleased to be with you all today. So I'm a family doctor here in Toronto. I practice family medicine here for over 17 years or so. I was a bit of a late bloomer in terms of the maid world and started uh, uh, providing MAID in sort of early 2018. Um, it's probably about a third of my work right now, so sort of a couple days a week. Um, I am a community-based MAID provider, so I provide MAID in people's homes, nursing homes, retirement homes, although I do have access to hospital beds for um, people that may choose not to die at home or can't die at home for whatever reason. Um, I, in addition to my sort of maid work and general family practice work, I also have a grief therapy practice for kids and teens. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, just start off with some questions for you all, and I'll invite you to, to just chime in um, as we uh, as we go along i very much hope that we can have a more discussion format than a, a formal formal panel in in mid-march um, as we're all very aware of being in lockdown for the last few months um, cases of community transmission of covid 19 were confirmed in all of Pop, canada's provinces and territory declared states of emergency um, at that point in time, what were you thinking uh, in relation to your maid practice? What were what were your immediate concerns, and uh, and what came up for you? And I guess I'll I'll direct uh, Erica. Do you want to start us off on that? Sure. Um, so I, I had a, a bunch of different thoughts actually, um, none of which I don't think were any more pertinent than another. Um, I think one of the things that I thought was uh will i still be able to continue doing maid right because you know we were thinking about um you know can we professionally do this safely thinking about patients family members and our colleagues right if we you know exposed ourselves would we also expose you know our other members within our family practice clinic um one of the things that i faced probably um a little bit differently than my colleagues here is that um they were talking about redeploying me back to an icu setting uh, you know, versus being in the community and uh, being able to provide for me. So, you know, my, my thought was, wow, wh what am I going to do for all of my maid clients that I currently have and, and those ones that may possibly be, you know, interested in maid given COVID? Um, you know, my next thought went to how do I do maid and, and, and tell them that they have to restrict the number of family and friends that they can have during their death. How, how do I do that? I don't know that I can do that. Um, but you know, we're, we're all supposed to follow guidelines. So that was very, very much on the thought of my, you know, my, my, my first four thoughts. Then I thought, well, what if these families are not there? Like what impact does that have on the grieving process for them? How, how does that get their grieving started? Um, how do I protect myself? How do I protect my family? Um, you know, I'm sure that this is, you know, kind of chiming in with my colleagues here, and I, I'd certainly, you know, love to hear their thoughts on this as well. Yeah. Well, I had this crazy week. I mean, the, the lockdown happened, and I had seven deaths that week. And so I was, every day, there was a new email from the health authority telling us what we had to do. And uh, every um, day, I mean, I was dealing with a, a different hospital or a different care home 
or um, a different family that we had to figure out what we were doing. And uh, of course I had to get my own PPE to, to deal with um, them all. So, I mean, every day was crazy <laughs> in, in those first, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first week. It was just, just nuts going through all that. I wasn't um, uh, particularly frightened. I mean, I, I was able to get the PPE I needed and uh, was able to, to do it. It was just a matter of, you know, how do I negotiate this one? How do I negotiate that one? <laughs> uh, and and figure, it, figure it all out. Um, but as um, I, I'll, I'll explain in, in a few minutes, uh, the increase in suffering I saw was just uh, overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Susan, does that uh, jive with your experience? It absolutely, absolutely resonates with me. I, you know, I think my first thought was like, yikes, what on earth does this all mean? And I think the, the unknown, right, everything was unknown. Like as Ellen was saying, everything was different. There was just like your, the email inbox was so, it was unmanageable and it was conflicting half the time, right? Because different, and Ontario has so many different branches of public health this that you didn't know who to listen to or what to read. So I just deleted all of them and sort of went by instinct half the time. Um, but absolutely, I think the question of PPE for sure was a big deal as a community-based provider. The hospitals had locked down their PPE, right? So it was the Toronto Maid community all getting together and sharing. There were homemade gowns being made, homemade masks being made, just people coming together and then doing front porch drop-offs, right, to share stuff because we didn't have access to anything. Uh, and to be honest, we really still don't, right? Like nothing has come to my front door that I haven't stolen or borrowed, essentially. Um, maybe don't quote me on that one, although this is being videotaped. Um, you know, the other big thing that came up early um, was medications uh, and concern about medication shortages because the alert from Health Canada, I can't remember exactly when it came out, but it was early enough just saying that there would be a shortage, there could, there was, could likely be a shortage of medications used that we use in MAID. Um, and I think in part because the medications used in MAID are used um, in the ICU, right, to help put people um, to sleep, to be able to be put on ventilators and respirators. Um, and so I was getting calls from anxious and frantic patients of mine who I'd found eligible but hadn't yet wanted to proceed with MAID, um, trying to figure out, are they going to lose their opportunity because of medication shortages? So there was this whole cohort of patients that I was essentially keeping in touch with every couple of days saying, the pharmacy still says they've got a three-week supply. You know, home care still says that nursing will go out into the community, but trying to keep track of that on a regular basis and reassure patients without falsely them, I found a pretty tricky balance. Yeah, yeah, so much to, uh, to juggle at that time and so many unknowns. Um, I think that's the, the, uh, the most difficult thing. And people who are at a stage where they want certainty. I mean, made a decision that is made often for having that, that sense of what is going to be next and having a, a bit more uh, control over that. So um, that, that sounds like it would have been really stressful for, for your patients as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so many of the questions that we received at Dying with Dignity from people were from people who were wondering if they could access MAID um, if they became critically ill with COVID and needed to go on a respirator. Uh, and many of them said they would not want to have that intervention. And then could they access MAID as an alternative? And I know for a while we didn't quite know what was going on on the ground. Can you Talk a little bit about that, that early point where people were wondering how to, if they would be able to access MAID, if MAID could be provided, what that did to people's decision making, what were the consequences of that, um, and, uh, and were you asked to assess or provide in, in a situation like this where, where somebody has the choice of going on a ventilator or, um, or wants to, uh, to access MAID if they're uh, that critically ill. 
Um, Susan, why don't I throw that off to you first? You know, I'm not 100% sure if I'm the best person to answer this, but I'll tell you why, and then maybe my colleagues, you know, can jump in. Um, but what I will say is that for, that I heard this concern loud and clear um, early on, both from colleagues and also from patients um, and just the community, right? I think at the onset of the pandemic, um, I think people were terrified of dying um, a terrible death from COVID because we were hearing all these awful things about this disease. Um, and there was certainly much discussion about this amongst the maid and the palliative care community. Um, you know, I didn't have any requests in part because I don't work in a hospital, so I wouldn't be getting requests from people who are critically ill. Um, and with respect to people who were maybe critically ill from COVID and deteriorating rapidly, that would really be probably in the hands of palliative care colleagues. Um, but what I can tell you is that palliative care colleagues were, um, I think, just um, completely sort of inundated with how this was going to happen, um, how they were going to be able to support this potential onslaught of um, people who were sick quickly um, and rapidly from COVID. Um, but I myself did not have any requests that sort of fit in this. Um, I, I think what you're getting at, I also think with respect to COVID, what we did know early on is that people were dying when not very many people got very sick from COVID, but from the people that did get admitted, let's say to the, I, like to the ICU, is that people would die quite quickly right, if they were on a respirator. And so the option of MAID would probably be quite unlikely, both because people deteriorated so rapidly um, and because capacity might be an issue for those folks. Um, but um, I'm very curious if Erica and Ellen have experience to share that are more relevant than what my answer was. Uh, our whole health authority didn't have any requests from somebody dying of COVID. Uh, it, it, I was involved a little bit in preparing for that. So mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, there was a, a plan that uh, people with COVID who needed palliative care would go to a particular place uh, in the city. And it just happened to be a Catholic hospital that didn't allow me. Uh, so then uh, it, the issue was, okay, if one of them wanted made, then, um, uh, it was, but th that was all in planning. It was never used. Uh, so, in general, when people were dying of COVID, they were in the intensive care unit uh, and anesthetized, so they couldn't ask for MAID, or they were um, uh, already a um, do not resuscitate situation in a care home um, where they were sedated, uh, hopefully well sedated, uh, to get through this and, uh, and were already, you know, very much uh, near the end of end of life, and so um, I certainly was in COVID care homes. I had patients who asked for me who also had had COVID, but it wasn't the COVID; it was the cancer that was the issue. So I was never actually dealing with it, and I know that nobody in our health authority were, was. So here in Nova Scotia, um, you know when COVID started, uh, we as a health authority and a clinician's advisory council decided that MAID was an essential service. Um, there was that kind of rhetoric happening, is it, is it not? Um, the health authority left it to us as individual providers to decide if we would continue to provide MAID during COVID or not. Um, I certainly did continue to provide during COVID. I did not provide for anyone that had a diagnosis of COVID. Uh, the majority of our COVID cases were very much centered around Halifax, of course, where the majority of our population exists. It's quite unique in that I'm, I'm very rural down here in Annapolis Royal, and sometimes when, it's, when we're talking about MAID, of course, the amount of providers and assessors in rural areas are very, very slim, right? And our numbers are small. So we tend to cover huge geographic areas. And so sometimes that's very difficult, right? Because we, you know, we feel a need to help these folks. And so we do a lot of travel. We put a lot of time and hours into our maid work. However, because we are so rural, 
the COVID cases here were absolutely zilch. We had none in our area. And so, you know, sometimes we curse being rural and other times we like that being a park because social distancing is much easier, you know, when you live in a rural setting. So, um, so yeah, so I did provide during COVID, but I didn't provide for anyone with COVID. Um, to my knowledge, I do not believe anyone in the Halifax area in our ICU had COVID uh, made deaths either. Um, I think Ellen brought this up before. Um, one of the biggest considerations for a lot of people who contacted Dying with Dignity was the possibility of dying alone um, with family and loved ones not able to visit. And there would be, you know, strict quarantine protocols. And it was causing a lot of stress for people and anticipatory um, grief and situations that might come up. I'm wondering if you have um, particular stories or, or, or information to, to um, I guess, sort of lay out the impact of the environment on people's level, you know, emotional stress in, in this period of time and whether that shifted or, or how, how things have played out. Um, yes, for sure, because in addition to the 20 people that I have uh, assisted during COVID, uh, I've been doing research on it. So I have the information uh, from many more cases. And what we all noticed was this um, terrible increased suffering at the end of life due to, um, uh, mostly due to lack of, of loved ones around. And yes, I can tell you story after story after story, they're horrible. Um, so I had a patient in a care home who wanted to um, uh, have made uh, a month later uh, with, of course, the idea that this last month of his life was going to be uh, time spent with family, but he was completely isolated. So uh, he said, there's no point in living if I can't be with my family. Um, he, he was very high level care, so it wasn't a situation where it was easy to take him home, but the family did that. They decided that they could manage for, that this was, you know, 24 hour care, uh, full body care, um, that the family um, took him home and did all of that care for a few days, just so that they could spend time with him before he died, and he had a month less of living that than he, he wanted to have. Um, and, you know, when I came to, to provide, um, uh, me and the nurse all suited up in our PPE, it was a bit awkward because uh, we had five family members who had been living together, you know, doing 24 hour care for their father. Um, but we weren't supposed to be in a room with five other people at that point, you know, it was, it was a bit awkward, but you know, it's like, okay, don't worry, we're, we're, we're protected, they can take their own risks, um, that's got nothing to do with us. Uh, and we, that was echoed so many times from the participants in our study, where they said that uh, over and over again, they were in these awkward situations where people were breaking rules and, um, uh, but it was the end of life. It's this person was dying and they were breaking rules because, because it was the right thing to do. And, and so, so, so I can tell you so many stories. One of the issues had to do with palliative care. So um, there was no transfers allowed between um, institutions in our city during the, the worst of, of COVID. And there still is restrictions. And so I had a patient who was in um, an acute ward in the hospital and she needed to be in the palliative care unit. She would have been there had uh, there been transfers, but there weren't, and she wasn't allowed there. So the palliative care doctor was seeing her on the, on the acute ward, but her symptoms were not under control. She was, she was suffering terribly, and she wasn't allowed anybody except her wife there. Um, but she wasn't allowed, I mean, she, she was allowed one person and limited timing. Um, and so she mm -hmm. wasn't allowed both her children and her wife and so uh, she, again, went home at a time that she was not physically capable of going home and her wife wasn't really physically capable of taking care of her at home. But it was the only way that she could physically 
you know, see her children as well as her wife before she died. And uh, so that's what she did. And again, she would have lived longer if she could have spent time with her family and been, I mean, maybe the palliative care unit couldn't have done anything for her, but probably she would have been more comfortable had she been able to be on the palliative care ward instead or a hospice, neither of which she was allowed to be in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, um, uh, and, and the, another situation where I was at a, uh, a family's home and, you know, it was lucky in one way that all the adult children were working from home. <laughs> so none of them had to take time off work to, um, uh, they were flexible, had flexible work schedules in order to spend time, uh, again, helping their mother take care of their father because he needed fairly high level care and um, uh, just deciding how to, to manage the distancing but not distancing um, uh, because it was the end of his life. And so again, lots of rules being broken in that home um, with three households coming into the other household so four households together um in there but but and and you know one daughter thought she was okay to hug her father but the others were staying at the other end of the room i mean it was it was yeah. it was an awful i mean just compared to what i'm used to and then of course my nurse and i had to come in all suited up so we looked like aliens <laughs> have you found you've adapted like your PPE to you know not have the, the not look like an alien? <laughs> um, so I usually now, unless I'm, I'm in, if I'm in a COVID care home, of course I'm wearing both a mask and a shield. But if I'm just in somebody's home or some really low risk area, I'll just wear a shield because. Um, I can breathe better <laughs> and because I, I feel more human um, than when I'm in my usual, um, so, you know, if I'm uh, in a place like a COVID care home, um, then, you know, I'll be a little bit better um, covered up like this, although uh, I'm not wearing N95s in that situation, but um, uh, I guess I would if my patient had active uh, COVID when I was there. Um, the patient that I assisted who did have COVID was already um, recovering from COVID. Not from the cancer, of course, but from the COVID. Right, right. Is it any uh, adaptations that you uh, you made on that that basis to I mean, yeah I mean I, I still I do wear a mask and a shield um, you know my shield always says my full name on it I put big masking tape across it um, when I'm doing maid visits if I haven't actually done a virtual assessment maybe first where someone has seen me face to face um, I'll bring a couple pictures of myself um, and so people actually appreciate that. We'll share a couple of pictures because I'm often looking at people's pictures, you know, people are often showing me, you know, we get shown photo albums and the whole family on the wall and here I am in a mask. So I'll often now carry a couple photos just in my pocket to show people so they actually see my face. Um, I think people appreciate that. Um, you know, I think one of the really beautiful things about MAID is that it gives people the ability to die surrounded by their loved ones, right? And COVID has really robbed people of that in, in many circumstances. You know, I have the luxury of providing most of the time in people's homes. And so, yeah, we can break the rules a bit, um, or there just aren't the rules to break because there aren't the, you know, there's no hospital infrastructure. So um, I haven't provided just because of just the nature of referrals, I guess, in as many nursing homes, you know, a couple of retirement homes where there are experiences like Ellen's, you know, where we really are restricted to one family member and that's really difficult. Um, 
you know, I can share the, my mother-in-law died by maid on May 1st and she had dementia and frailty and, you know, her circumstance really wasn't affected at all by maid, right? Um, it just so happened that it needed to happen on May 1st or around that time, regardless of what was happening in the great outdoors and in the great world. And um, I think she and my father-in-law were both pretty oblivious to what was happening outside because their lives had become so small. And I think that's still true for many of the patients that I've been caring for and provided for where, you know, someone's been suffering from ALS for a long time. And it just so happened that the time was April 15th because they didn't want to go on a respirator. So oblivious to what's going on with respect to COVID. You know, in my mother-in-law's circumstance, you know, yeah, I guess we broke the rules about the number of people that could be there. and We all had to wear masks and we weren't supposed to hug, but we hugged. You know, I think each family does what they need to do, right? We make our own decisions about risk. And I tell that to families, right? That your family is unique. Um, your household is unique and you have to make the decisions that are right for you and for your family. Um, you know, I have to be comfortable with that as a provider, right? We're making a risk assessment for every situation that we go in um, and none of them have been the same, right? I'm not sure I would do a provision with 25 people, you know, with guitars and grandkids like I've sometimes done and thank God that hasn't come up as a request because I'd sort of hate to say no to that but would probably have to say no to that, right? So I'm, we'd have to do it outside the window. You know, I have had a lovely provision not ideal, but, you know, thankfully someone was on the first floor of the retirement home and the family, other than the one allowed, was in lawn chairs outside the window. It was still cold. Everyone had their winter coats on and the window was open and I would run back and forth in my alien suit and say, this is what I just did. And then I'd go back and do something else. And this is what I just did. And people were yelling through the window and singing. And um, I don't know what we would have done if she'd been on the second floor. That would have been a lot harder to do um, but I've also been amazed at how adaptable families are and how creative families are um, and it's really been quite a privilege to sort of witness that from and also be part of it too in my own family just recognizing it didn't matter too much eh, you know um, but I also recognize that that's not everyone's experience and that's not been my experience uh, in participating in uh, providing mate either, but those are a couple of my thoughts. Yeah. So uh, I'll chime in here and, and again, because this is recorded, I guess I can't go back and recant it later, <laughs> but um, I guess I am, I am the rule breaker. Um, because the, I, I'm fortunate in that the maids that I have provided for during COVID have all been at home. I have not restricted the number of people that are allowed to be there. Um, I have asked the correct questions and done the correct screening um, of all members who were going to be present. Hopefully I got the truthful answer. Um, I'm going to think I did. But for me, I just and again, right, it's very much a preference individual, but I cannot provide for me behind a mask or a shield. Um, there's just something in my own head that it just takes that personal contact that, that you know, I, I mean, I speak with my face all the time, and I just cannot get behind a mask or a shield. And and I guess, you know, for me, because we're in such a rural area and the people I've provided for, we, we just know that our COVID numbers are so incredibly low that the risk to myself, the risk to other people were minimal. Um, I mean, as opposed to Susan in Toronto, Ellen in Vancouver, right, I don't know what, I, I'm sure I would have changed my practice had I been in a big, you know, urban setting. Um, but for me, the maids have been whomever they wanted there and without PPE. No. <laughs> I may regret saying that later. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm hearing is that this is an incredibly intimate moment and that anything 
that interferes with that connection um, doesn't feel right to you as as providers yeah yeah and that that makes a lot of sense um, absolutely yeah. um, I think uh, Ellen you mentioned about uh, the client I, I was just thinking about Jean Truchon who um, was the the man who successfully fought against um, fought to expand medical assisted dying laws um, in the recent Quebec Supreme Court decision that came down in in April and um, he decided that he was living in long term care he had planned his death for quite some time and he, with the risk of COVID coming. Um, he decided that his preference was to move forward his made date versus risk risk a COVID death. I think you you had touched on that a bit. Are there any other cases where, like, there's been an acceleration of the process for for fear of COVID or? Um, so what my patients will tell me is just that life is so awful under COVID. Um, due to all the restrictions that um, there is no point in living on when they have already uh, a, a fatal illness and uh, and so on. Um, mostly it has to do with not being able to be uh, with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, that people want to die sooner than they would normally have. Um, and, and, and just that their, their lives, I mean, I've been in so many care homes and uh, in this in these last three months and uh, life is horrible there and um, uh, you know all the programs are, sh are shut down um, all the volunteers are gone uh, and all the um, family caregivers and visitors are gone except for you know one if there's a family caregiver who is a needed caregiver they are now allowed in but they weren't at the first the first one there, nobody was allowed in and so it was weird you know I was allowed into every care home <laughs> and, and um, had their own daughters weren't allowed in and it was uh, it just made life um, so awful yeah. is making life so awful for people yeah I'm, I'm glad to hear the situation is improving uh, in places and in terms of some place allowing uh, more visitation I certainly hope that that's the uh, the case in the future um, particularly for the carers within the within the family um, there's another um, thing that we had talked about COVID as a life threatening disease, like in, in John Truchon's case, he didn't want to have that, that risk associated with it. Um, but then there's the actual living with less support, not only family members, but the strains on the healthcare system. Um, shortages of healthcare workers and services, um, particularly in home settings, I would imagine that that's that's become um, a, an issue for for patients as well. Um, do you want to talk a bit about that? Um, um, I'll throw that out to uh, to Erica. Um, any? Yeah. So um, again, you know, we we would live in a very unique little community here. Um, we have a a collaborative healthcare center in which we kind of have a emergency department. We have um, six inpatient beds, three of which are meant to be palliative. And then we have our family practice clinic there as well. The lab is there, x rays there. We kind of have like a, a collaborative center. And so during times of COVID, when people have had less help at home, we have actually used some of our beds for what we call social admissions. And so we will bring some loved ones in that need that extra care that they're not able to have at home and we'll admit them for you know whatever we need three to four or five six seven days in order for the caregivers to recharge regroup um, in order for you know someone to you know potentially just even have some downtime of their own right um, so we've been able to do some social admissions which is really great it gives some respite to caregivers and uh, families. 
we have also kind of redesignated some of our uh, clinicians into different roles. So we have a family practice nurse and a social worker. And um, we had our, those two folks checking in, like calling all of our folks over the age of 70 to do uh, check-ins just to make sure they were doing okay at home, to make sure that they had supports that they needed. You know, was there anything that we could provide? Because, you know, sometimes a lot of people won't reach out, right? Um, and so during that time, we, we had some redesignation of duties just to make sure that we were caring for those folks. From a MAID perspective, um, I continue to check in with all of my MAID patients as I do normally. Um, I normally check in every month uh, for people who have been assessed and qualified but are not quite ready. Um, during COVID, I did check in more often just simply because I wanted to make sure that, you know, we weren't having the frailty of the disease process interacting with, you know, potential COVID and, you know, were we going to have to do something emergently versus could we plan for something? So that's kind of how we've kind of had to kind of move things around during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Could we bring your model to Toronto? Erica, <laughs> I think the greater Toronto area could use a bit of that continuity, which we don't have at all. Um, you know, I when I when I was listening to your question, Maureen, about Jean Truchon, you know, he really was a canary in, in the coal mine, sadly, predicting really the carnage that has happened in particularly Quebec and Ontario long-term care facilities. Um, and he was right. He was right about what was going to happen, you know, in many circumstances, sadly. And Ellen, you are um, describing that adeptly, sadly. Um, you know, I've sort of divided my made requests now into three categories. Like the first being sort of like my mother-in-law, right? Like, or the patient with ALS who didn't want to go on a ventilator. Like COVID was just sort of in the background, right? Maybe affected by um, the actual provision, people having to wear masks or maybe how many people were there. Um, but really the timing was not influenced by COVID so much. And then the second group being similar to Jean Truchon, that he ultimately was going to have made, had planned to have made prior to COVID, um, but the timing was changed. And Ellen, you described many situations like that, right? Where someone's like, well, if I can't see any of my family, I don't have anything to live for, even though I'd wanted to live on for a couple months. So I'm choosing to have made earlier. And I've certainly seen that in my own maid practice over the last couple months. Um, I think the third category is the one that causes me more stress. Um, and that's where I'm wondering if the request for MAID is really driven by the social isolation um, and maybe the lack of healthcare access or personal support access, that sort of thing, um, due to COVID. So, you know, I received a referral for an elderly woman in a retirement home because she's lonely. And I'm not really sure she was that lonely before COVID, right? And that is, those are challenging assessments where you're really having to dig a little bit to figure out what's the underlying cause there. Are there any solutions, creative solutions that might um, solve, maybe not solve the problem because COVID is still there, but reduce some of that suffering outside of MAID? Um, but those requests are happening and I find those difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ellen, did you have any, uh, any reflections um, to add on, on that? I know you've shared a couple of stories. Yeah, I, I, I just see that um, end of life is harder for everybody. And um, it, when it's actual end of life, uh, but also, if you're in the last five years of life, um, uh, it, it's also so much more difficult. I mean, you know, we miss our friends, spending time with our friends too, but um, we Zoom and we can do stuff like that. It's, it's not um, like it is for somebody who's uh, 85 and in a care home who um, now can't see her family and uh, 
uh, the kind of pleasant interactions that she was used to in the care home with, uh, you know, the recreation director doing programs of various kinds and so on. All of that's canceled. And so it's, it just makes life, as you say, not worth living. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know that it's difficult with all the changes and the constant change um, that we, we end up adapting to with this, this pandemic just on an ongoing basis. Um, but knowing what you do now um, and with your practice in made as it's evolved in the COVID environment, are there things that you see going forward um, that you have, um, you know, that you're anticipating changes that you might have to adapt to, you know, two months from now or, or things that um, just sort of the future of made within probably a ongoing environment for quite some time. Um, well, we haven't talked about the good stuff yet. Um, the good stuff was that uh, uh, the witnessing is now virtual. I mean, it was it should always have been virtual, but now we can have virtual witnesses. We don't have to have strangers coming into people's homes or into um, institutions to do with the witnessing of the uh, patient request form. So that's great. And uh, we're allowed to do um, more virtual um, assessments. In BC, they re re insisted that only one of the two assessors was uh, virtual, but now both can be. And so can we get the psychiatrist uh, who does the capacity assessments for us um, can, can do it virtually. So that's great. Um, and so it means um, quicker access for people. Uh, you know, we, we, it's a lot easier to, figure out a time to do a virtual assessment than it is to drive an hour <clears throat> uh, out to somebody's place. And uh, so that's, um, that's been, been great. And um, forever we were just outraged that, that the pharmacist, we, we would take um, the unused drugs back to the pharmacist and they would have to destroy them all. And uh, since we now had this, shortage of propofol and some of the other drugs, um, they've changed the rules. And these were rules that were unchangeable because they involved bureaucracies that were just like, um, I don't know, combination of cement and elephant or something. And they, they, these just changed. And suddenly, um, now it's okay that uh, a doctor or nurse practitioner is actually trusted with drugs and is allowed to bring them back and have them reused. And uh, so we've had some wonderful changes that could never have happened um, without this. So uh, I'm thrilled with these changes, making um, some kinds of access better and, um, and you know, the environment better uh, because of COVID. Uh, so for sure, and you know the fact that um, uh, we have to use uh, virtual witnessing and so on means that uh, a bunch of people I that I got to know uh, who weren't used to using um, video um, platforms started using video platforms and then started using them for other people too. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. I am. I am uh, delighted with uh, uh, some of the changes that COVID caused. Here in Nova Scotia, uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority did not allow any of its employees to witness anything. Mm -hmm. um, and since COVID came in, they've changed the rules and uh, all NSHA employees are able to be witnesses, which was awesome because, you know, before if you were a caregiver, you couldn't be a witness and now you can. So we are really lobbying that uh, the health authority continues with this change and that we don't revert back once COVID is, uh, I don't know if it's ever going to be done, but once COVID settles. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. You know, the other thing that um, happened in Ontario, and I'm not sure if it's happening in other provinces to the same extent, I mean, this comes down to to um, how we're paid, right? And no one likes to talk about that because that's all sort of dirty. How do we get paid? But 
um, in Ontario, we never got paid for making telephone calls, right? And then all of a sudden there's this shift to, well, if we can't see our patients face to face, how are we going to see them? We're going to see them either virtually or we're going to talk to them on the phone. Um, so I guess you're going to pay us for that. In, in Ontario, it took three months for them to figure out how to pay us for that. That's another story. Um, but now we can do some of our work on the phone. And with MADE, we know in particular, there is so much, um, so much of our work is done in between, right? Our face-to-face -face assessments, and it's so needed. So as you were saying, Erica, you're in touch with your um, sort of cohort, right, of patients every month. And many of us sort of practice the same way. And it's hard to talk about payment when most nurse practitioners, certainly across um, Ontario, don't even get paid for MAID, right? Let alone me not getting paid for a phone call. But um, even in Ontario, I think that shift around discussions around payment for phone calls in the least, um, even nurse practitioner payment, has certainly come to the forefront a little bit in a way that's made it sort of okay to talk about. And I actually think that's a really good thing because I think we can provide better care and attract more providers, frankly, to be doing this work. So um, I think we're all very hopeful, we meeting made providers in Ontario, I can't talk about other provinces, are hopeful that some of this these ways of remuneration or in some of our advocacy efforts will pay off a bit, no pun intended, um, you know, as time goes on and once the COVID sort of restrictions settle down, because I think it does have implications for how we do our work. Some great points. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, ask Kelsey to, uh, to uh, join us again and um, to bring in some of the uh, the live questions that, that people have posted. I see there's about 10 online right now. Um, so Kelsey, uh, any questions for, for uh, our panelists? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for all the fantastic information so far. We have lots of really wonderful comments coming through about how um, how great this has been to hear more about your perspective and your experiences during uh, COVID-19. Um, one theme that is coming through is uh, with the pandemic, it's really made people think about what they would want or not want at end of life. And sometimes that includes MAID, sometimes that doesn't. So what can individuals do now to plan for end of life? What types of discussions should they be having with loved ones or those who'd be you know, making decisions if they were unable to? Um, and how should they approach those conversations with loved ones when maybe it's not the, the easiest conversation to have or, or to get started? So um, I'll just kind of chime in a little bit. Uh, one of the first things that I think, you know, that you have to evaluate is really what your values are. You know, what what do you want at the end of life? At the end of life, are you looking for quality? Are you looking for quantity? Um, are you looking to, you know, soak every last minute, or are you looking to, you know, end life when it's not got, you know, not worth living, not have the quality? And I think that. You know, while the conversations are difficult to have, they are of the utmost importance to have. And, and it's important to share with your families because, you know, there's nothing worse than at the end of life to not be able to voice what you want and your family to be at odds. You know, we've seen that time and time again as providers, not just for me, but as healthcare providers. And to have a conversation often and truthfully is very important. I, I, I think that sort of says it all, Erica. You know, one of the things I always, you know, I'm a, I'm a grief therapist. I work with kids and, and teens and certainly having honest, um, informative conversations, open conversations about the most difficult stuff is something that we know improves our mental health, improves our well-being, decreases our anxiety, 
and helps us grieve better. Um, and I often say to parents about kids, um, and I often say this to families about their loved ones going through MAID is there's rarely something that the person you're worried about hasn't already thought about, right? So um, when it comes to um, you know, a family member thinking about MAID, they've, they've already gone through all the scenarios in, or someone who may be dying of a disease. They've already gone through all the worst case scenarios. They've run everything through their head. And so you're never asking them about something they probably haven't thought about, right? But oh, what a gift to be able to give someone to say, hey, can we have this difficult conversation? What is it that you're thinking about? Like, what should we lay on the table? And recognizing that it's hard and messy, you can't really say anything wrong other than not saying anything at all, right? So it's really just opening the door to communication um, and being okay with whatever comes from that. They said it all. <laughs> Great. Thank, thanks, everyone. Um, so the next question, it, it actually ties in nicely to what you just talked about, Susan, and what you mentioned um, earlier on in the conversation. Um, but Erica, you also brought this up as well. You said, you know, with the difficulty of uh, potentially limiting family members and how you as a provider, you know, wanted to make sure that that wasn't the case and that people could die surrounded by the people that uh, they loved. Um, you know, if that wasn't the case, how do those individuals get their grieving started? And the question here is, is just, you know, wondering if, if the three of you could expand on that a little bit and, you know, how grief might be looking different um, during COVID-19, given some of the um, situations that you've mentioned with visitation, you know, hours and, and number of people being limited, um, and, and maybe expanding on some of those concerns or, or what that reality um, might be. I, I definitely think Susan is the best one to, to acknowledge this, um, you know, given her expertise in the area. But, you know, I, I think that one of the biggest things would be finding the closure. You know, somehow being there at the event, you know, of the loved one's death, that's the closure. And, and then the, the healing can start to begin. And I think that by missing that, we have to figure out, we have to, as providers, help people find that closure, different ways to find it. Susan, would you agree? Well, I guess I would say, I mean, I agree that um, we have to find a way to be there, so to speak, to be present. I would, sometimes the, the way I word it to families is that um, to be present, we don't have to be physically present, right? So there are so many ways that we can be with someone without actually being there beside someone. And that's often how we're with someone after they've died, right? Is that um grief is really about love right it's about someone's presence with us forever right going on and so um the decision to be present at someone's maid or someone's end of you know last days is a very personal one and it may not be someone's choice to want to do that and i would always respect that and say you don't have to be physically present to be present with your loved one so what are some ways how can we think about this um, what are some things you want to say to your loved one ahead of time? Um, you know, I always encourage kids I work with to carry something of their, uh, you know, of their loved one around with them, whether that's an old, you know, they can take a scrap of a t-shirt and stick it in their pocket with them to school or a necklace or an earring or, you know, whatever it is so that they're carrying something of their person with them all the time. Um, and the same thing can happen with MAID, is we can give something to the dying person so that they have our physical presence with them in something um, physical, I didn't say that very well, and vice versa, right? So there are so many creative ways, I think, that we can work with families so that they can feel that they're there in whatever capacity they have 
and <laughs> barring all the restrictions of COVID too, right? So even if they want to be there physically, okay, well you can't. So what are we going to do with that? So let's let's work with that. Anything to add, Ellen? Not really. I, I was just thinking about a friend of mine who's been grieving during COVID, and one of the issues was that he maybe could have traveled to spend time with his mother before she died, before everything shut down, but he didn't. And then she, she got worse, and then he couldn't. And um, and it felt terrible about that. But, you know, I mean, that's just the kind of thing that happens, right? But um, this happens when somebody is, is um, close by or, or, you know, in the same country, which, which his mother wasn't, um, that, that you wish you'd spent more time with the person who um, uh, is there. So, I mean, COVID made a huge difference to his grieving. It was, it was, it was horrible. He couldn't go then and be with his siblings uh, afterwards. Uh, he couldn't um, do the kind of things that he normally did to reduce stress because of the lockdown. Uh, and so grieving was really extra hard for, for him. And I guess uh, that's probably true of a whole lot of people right now. Yeah, and, and on that topic as well, um, you know, family members and loved ones who have gone through a, a maid or end of life experience with someone there dealing with added complications. But in general, even if we're not at end of life or, or have a loved one at end of life, we're dealing with a lot of additional stress during this very uh, uh, unique time in our lives. Um, so I'm wondering what, how self-care looks to you, for you as a, as a provider, both uh, during normal times, whatever that, that looks like, um, and how that may have changed now uh, that COVID is, is, um, is in our lives. And if there's a, a difference between how you, um, how you take care of yourselves as, as made providers in these very difficult times. Who's first? <laughs> well, I am intensely grateful that I have, uh, that I don't live alone, that I have a partner at home because there's somebody I can touch and who will listen to me when I come home and be supportive. Um, and my cats also are very good at, at listening. <laughs> uh, but I think that, that um, my support for maid work has always been my calling, mostly my colleagues. And most of that was all virtual anyway, uh, that it was part, being part of the uh, Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers. We have the uh, forum that uh, is very active and our case sharing, which Dying with Dignity Canada helps us with. And uh, so I think that, that um, we are each other's support a whole lot of the time. And uh, that's certainly where I, where I get my supports. Yeah, I, I echo that as well. Um, I think people maybe don't quite understand how rewarding this work is as opposed like if you, you know, if I were to balance this out between the stress and the reward, there really, it, it, it there's often no competition, um, especially sometimes compared to some of the other uh, stresses that, that come up in my life. So the, the rewards really are huge um and so you know i always ask myself did i respond as best as i could to the patient and to the family and um that's often a pretty good you know way of self-care right like i i'm doing my job well <laughs> um and the patients and families think so too and absolutely there is this incredible um canadian-wide support network and I certainly have a local support network who are made colleagues. I mean, you know, like there's always someone I can text 
like, and you know, if they don't text back right away, I go to the next person <laughs> and there's always someone who will respond. Um, and who will reach out and help. Um, and that's, it's not like that in the rest of my work, although I have amazing colleagues in the rest of my work and this wonderful support network as well. The May community is pretty unique that way. So, I mean, for me, um, again, I mean, you're, you're all envious of where I work um, because my, my colleagues in my family practice are phenomenal. Um, incredible um as you guys have both said our main community um is very supportive um you know we, we learn from each other we we feel the support of each other we'll often be thinking the same thing the other person is saying you know it, it's a very tight community um and, and i have actually susan thought on this which is you know a lot of people will always ask like oh my god how do you do this work you know and how do you keep doing this work but the work, and, and I don't, I don't like the word rewarding, but I'm not liking the word rewarding. Because for me, um, I feel that when there's no other way to help, this is the ultimate help, right? Made is the ultimate form of helping someone. And so for me, that's my goal. I need to help people. And I don't know how that looks. It looks different in my family's practice. It looks different in whatever I do. And so May looks different again, but it's helping. And so at the end of the day, when I go home and go to bed, if I've helped someone, the day is great, you know? And so the work itself is rewarding. It's, it's not that I need to de-stress because things are horrible, you know, because I provide for me. That's, that's not way, the way it goes. Now, whether right or wrong, I also have a husband. And he tends to stand sometimes with his hand on his hip, and he wants to know how many more hours I can fit in the day. All right, I know when that happens, I gotta take back a little bit because obviously I'm working too much. So I have a little home monitor gauge here that tells me when enough is enough. Yeah. yeah. It helps to have those people, doesn't it? <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's a pain in the bottom. <laughs> I think we for, uh, for one more question, Kelsey. Sure. Okay. So this question um, earlier on in the discussion, the option of made for somebody who had COVID nineteen was discussed, and how often it's the case that. Um, the person does decline rather quickly and is put on a ventilator and at that point they wouldn't have capacity to um, to make that request for made so this person is wondering you know if an individual who's say you know in their 70s or 80s and doesn't want a ventilator um, and maybe made isn't an option for them what what are the other options and what would the person expect at end of life in that situation? It would be conscious sedation. So if somebody was um, sick and uh, did not want to have a ventilator, um, wanted to just get comfort care uh, for the end of life, it would be sedation to the point of being asleep. And so when we're providing made we tell people you know you'll be asleep within a minute or so and then you won't wake up um and for the rest of the people around you it'll take about five minutes um, before your heart stops when we're talking to people about end of life um, in the other situations it's uh i'll give you this medication and you will um, go to sleep and you won't wake up. Um, but for the people around them, that can be days and days. So um, for the person themselves, you know, I hope they'll get really good care and that they will not be suffering through, um, through, you know, respiratory failure. Any other comments on that, Erica or Susan? 
Okay, great, great. I think um, that's all of our, our time here. Um, I want to, um, to thank you all so, so much. The chats and comments are coming in. It's uh, a lot of appreciation to you all for, for joining us and your, your, your honesty in, uh, in sharing personal things about yourself as well as your practice. Um, I think it's given our, our audience a really good look into what it is like to be a MAID practitioner in Canada right now and during this um, really unusual time of COVID-19. So, so thank you all so, so much for sharing. Um, I also wanna thank Kelsey uh, for her support in putting together this webinar and particularly on the q and it's, um, it's hurting cats to get all the information going at the same time and keep the technology going. So I'm super appreciative of, of her efforts as well. And I want to uh, thank the, uh, the audience and our supporters for joining us today. Um, our work at Dying with Dignity is not possible without you. And um, we thank you for taking the time to be here today. Um, so thank you to each of the, uh, the speakers. If you had any um, last things you wanted to say, it's last call. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it an afternoon here. All right, thank you all very much. Take care and, uh, and take care of each other. Bye-bye.